At the start of any given day, there is mystery available. There is a game waiting for an open heart to say yes. Here I am, I'll play. And if we're smart, we'll listen to the and all the misery that held us down We'll let it fade Let it be outshined by a simple spark Of a life That's waiting to be made That's waiting to be made What will you make of this day? What will you keep? What will you change? What will you see? What will you believe? What will you make of your dreams? Will you keep sleeping? Or will you awake and decide what you will make? the start of any given day there is history and poetry there is a play but you're not in the audience you are the star so get out there and say what you What will you make of this day? What will you keep? What will you change? What will you see? What will you believe? What will you make of your dreams? Will you keep sleeping? Or will you awake and then decide just what you will make of this day? What will you keep? What will you change? What will you see? And what will you believe? What will you make of your dreams? Will you keep sleeping? Or will you awake and then decide what you will
That's Leah Morris. What an amazing, uh, <clears throat> an amazing question for us, right? What will we make of this day? I just sometimes I just wake up in the morning and play that as my as my opening opening song for the day, and just ask myself that question over and over. Greetings, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I think there's as many people back here as there, so I'm going to turn here and say greetings. Welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Congregation, and greetings to those of you online. Thank you for joining us. I know some of you have chosen to stay under the covers this morning, and who can blame you, but, uh, but thank all of you for coming here today as well. And a special welcome to anybody who is joining us for the first time or after a little bit of an absence. Uh, thank you for coming back in, and you are very welcome. Here. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, and that means that we honor the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and we see the interconnectedness of life, and we celebrate that. And we do want everyone to know that you are welcome here, whether you're joining us online, in the seats, or in the choir. Today is our final day where we're going to be exploring the topic of our month, which was all around intention living into our intention. So far this month, we've looked at how to let go so that we can embrace the new. We've asked the questions about our intention behind our prophetic voice. We looked at how we can be stronger together in our work for justice. And last week, we asked, what do we really mean when we say we need not think alike to love alike? And today, I'm going to invite us into exploring one more intention, something about well, it's something that we all do two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times a day. Our food and our intentions and our connections with our food and with eating. So I think it's going to be a, a fun morning. We have a little exercise for those of you that are here. Those of you at home, I'll invite you into that too. Um, so let's begin with a poem. This is a poem by D.H. Lawrence, and it's called Mystic. They call all experience of the senses mystic when the, spirit, when the experience is considered. So an apple becomes mystic when I taste in it the summer and the snows and the wild welter of earth and the insistence of the sun, all of which are things I can surely taste in a good apple. Now, though some apples taste predominantly of water, wet and sour, some of too much sun, brackish sweet like lagoon water that has been too much sunned. If I say I taste these things in an apple, I am called mystic, which means to some a liar. The only way they think to eat an apple is to hog it down like a pig and taste nothing that is real. But if I eat an apple, I like to eat it with my senses awake. Hogging it down all at once is like feeding corpses. What do you think of that? Mmm, a little taste of what is in store for us, and that pun was intended. So let's celebrate the awakening of our senses and the gifts of this day by sharing our opening hymn. Those in the sanctuary, you're going to have to really sing it out so everyone can hear. It is in the, uh, no, the gray hymnal this morning, hymn 331, Life is the Greatest Gift of All. Please rise as you are able in body or spirit. Thank you. 
My name is Michael Myers, and I'm a member of the, let's see, the building IT team. I'm a member of the uh, COVID task force. I'm a member of the basis of the choir, and I'm an assistant worship associate, which is why I'm running up and down the staircases all the time right now. Each Sunday, we pause to light a candle of acknowledgement and remembrance for the Cherokee and Muscogee nations of people. These are the people who lived on this land before us, and we acknowledge their continued spiritual presence here by lighting a candle. May this candle humbly remind us of our interconnection with the, and the impact of our collective actions. May there be healing in all nations of people. Each Sunday, we also light our chalice. It's the light, it symbols the Unitarian Universalism and a reminder of our commitment to a beacon of love and hope to all who enter, whether they be in person or virtual out there in electronic land. Today's chalice lighting words are from a quote from Marcy Cohen Forrest. Southern food derives its strength from many cultures. It's a melding of food cultures from Native Americans, enslaved African Americans, and Europeans. May the flame of this chalice remind us of our interconnection through the power of food we share. Now, in the spirit of beloved community, let's greet and welcome each other to worship as we share our congregational affirmation we need not look like to love alike. For those in the sanctuary, feel free to move around and greet others. For those who are online, please use the chat or introduce yourself and unmute yourself and say hello online. and I'm also on the pastoral care team. The pastoral care team is available with listening ears and caring hearts to support you in challenging times. Each Sunday, we pause to share the personal joys and sorrows of the Emerson community. If you want to contact pastoral care, uh, anyone on the team, or share a joy, a sorrow, or a concern at a Sunday service, please email pastoralcare at emersonuu.org. When you're here in person, we also invite you to write your joys, sorrows, and concerns before the service in this yellow book. It's on our pastoral care table inside the main doors of the sanctuary. Reverend Deborah will be lighting our candles today, and we light our visual bowl. Its light represents the light of hope for, all, for a peaceful resolution of all conflicts on our planet. And at this time, I have an empty book. We have such a happy, happy, <laughs> joy, joy <laughs> congregation. <laughs> um, but we know that there are joys and sorrows that are too tender and too fragile to share publicly. We know that there are joys and sorrows that aren't spoken. So please feel free to say out loud or type into the chat the name of someone you're holding in your heart today.
Now let us send our heartfelt caring intentions to all of those things that have been spoken and to all beings everywhere. We'll be offering the Buddhist prayer of loving kindness. Please repeat the words after me. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May they be free from harm and suffering. May they be well in body, heart, and mind. May they be at peace. Blessed be. One way we put our prayer of loving kindness into action is by partnering with other organizations who work to bring love, kindness, and justice to the world. We encourage our members and friends to support our work financially as we share our weekly collection and also engaging in direct action. This month's sharing the work partner is Stronger Together. Stronger Together was founded in 2018 to advocate racial justice and serve as a soft place to fall for targets of racial violence within Cobb County School District. Stronger Together's aim is to abolish the systems and practices that dehumanize black and brown youth, and therefore all youth. They centralize youth wellness and youth voice by way of challenging policies that form, that harm students and families. Our support this month will help uh, them grow their organizational systems and their ability to offer support to youth and training for advocates. Additional information can be found in the Emerson Acts Justice Room. A link to ways to give is, uh, is posted in the chat. Please take a moment to support Emerson and Stronger Together. All donations, unless otherwise specified, are shared equally. Come up. Come on, young heart. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I have to do a little disclaimer. I had a little discussion with. Reverend Deborah, about the story. Oh, I'm sorry. A little disclaimer before I do this story. So this is um, a Zen story, and and I guess I needed a little bit of enlightenment beforehand about this Zen story. Um, okay, so I'll say that, and hopefully, parents, you'll process more afterwards about the story. Um, so. This story is about Pedro and his encounter with the tigers. Now let's just be clear that this is a little adaptation, right? Oh, 
Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, I mean part. Pedro, okay. right? Right. Oh, yes. Right. Pedro yes. wasn't in the original. No, thing. no, no, yeah. no. Okay, sorry. Okay. That's that's <laughs> me taking liberty here. Okay, okay. I, I named the man. Which you're allowed to do in censors. The man. That's just too nebulous. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Pedro is um, going to meet his friend Jaime. And he's running late, because Pedro is notorious for running late. And they're going to meet up in this new strawberry bar, Barre de Fresa, that's just opened up in the town. And um, Pedro decides that he's going to take a shortcut through the forest. But this forest is known to have tigers. And Pedro, unfortunately, encounters a tiger. On dun, the way. Dun. I'm sorry, I was just doing that. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. okay. Sound effects. <laughs> um, so he sees the tiger peering out through the woods. You know, those golden eyes that tigers have. It's kind of creepy. Um, and so he starts running, right? That's what you should do when you encounter a tiger. You start Is running. Is that so, what you should do? Yeah, okay. you should start running. Okay. I'm not so sure you can outrun a tiger, but you definitely should run it. Okay. Fight or flight. Is it? There's that... <laughs> Uh, response that your brain has. So he runs and runs and he comes to a cliff. And he looks down over the cliff. Fortunately, there's a vine. He grabs hold of the vine, goes over, holding onto the vine, but then he sees another tiger that's pacing down below. Ah, there's my next meal. So the tiger down below. And then while he's holding on to the vine, he sees this little mouse. And this mouse comes out from a crack in the rock and starts chewing on the vine. Okay, chewing, chewing, chewing. Nibbling on the vine. And Pedro's looking up. He's looking down. He looks to the right and he sees a patch of wild strawberries, mm. golden and red, and he smells mm. the strawberries. They smell wonderful, wonderful. Fortunately, they're within reach of his arm. So he grabs hold of a strawberry, takes the strawberry, and begins to chew on the strawberry. Mm. At the same time, the mouse is chewing on the vine. The end. See, now this is the part that, that Patricia needed a little spiritual counseling around. She's like, what is up with this story? <laughs> but I'm wondering what the kids think. What do you think of, why was he, what was the strawberry in that moment? Why was that strawberry important in that moment? Ooh. We will let you all to ponder. See, his body language is like mine. So. <laughs> like, no. We will let you all to ponder, right? Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Let's sing our song of dedication. <laughs> We have an opportunity ourselves. Could I ask Judy and James to start passing out? Coming out to you now, fresh and live for our uh, meditation, is not a strawberry, but a little box of raisins. So I'm going to invite everybody to take a box of raisins. I think there's enough for everyone to have their very own box. Choir, you got your box? Anybody need a box? These are nice organic raisins. Mm. 
Don't eat them yet. <laughs> Those of you at home, I'm so sorry. Catch. Ready? Or you could go to your own kitchen and hopefully find something akin to a raisin or a um, uh, fr uh, dried something or other. Or maybe even a nut or a seed or something. Anything that you would like. All right. So I'm going to invite us into a time of meditation today a little bit differently. I'm going to invite you to start out at least with your eyes open. But I'm going to invite you to take your open eyes and just gaze at this little box of raisins. And very consciously, go ahead and open up your box of raisins. Now I get music? I couldn't get music for the like, the dun dun dun. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to take one raisin out. One or two. And place that one raisin in your hand. Now, for some of us, this meditation is going to be a little bit different. You might need your reading glasses, but I'm going to invite you to take a moment with this raisin. So go ahead and, all kidding aside, we're going to take a moment to just allow the raisin at whatever distance from your eyes feel most comfortable to just gaze at your raisin. Maybe take your other hand and turn the raisin over so you can see it from a different angle. Notice the little, little crevices and wrinkles in the raisin. See if you can notice where the, the little stem was, which part of your raisin had the stem. So one part of the raisin was connected to the vine and one was not. Notice that part. Now letting that raisin just rest in your hand, soft eyes looking at your raisin. Take a moment and just comprehend that this one raisin was once one grape, one grape amongst millions in the world one grape that the wind touched, one grape that the sun shone down upon. Almost as if the ridges in the grape could tell a story. See if you can look at your little raisin and listen to its story. What was its life journey like there on the vine? What was it like to be picked and dried and packaged and transported. How many hands came in contact with the production, the packing, the transporting to get you this raisin right here today? And go ahead and lift your raisin up close to your nose if you like. Take your mask off if you want for a moment. See if you can smell it. Does it have a smell? And then if you'd like, and you're comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes as you gently put the raisin in your mouth. And don't chew at first. Just let the raisin sit there. See if you can start to feel the taste of the raisin before you even chew. A little bit of sweetness coming out. Maybe your tongue can feel the ridges of the raisin. And then very slowly, go ahead and start to chew your raisin or whatever the food is you have. But chew it slowly so that you can feel that first burst of flavor coming out of the raisin into your mouth. And breathe. And then with your eyes closed, if you're comfortable, go ahead and eat the raisin. This one single raisin.
And after you've taken the raisin in, go ahead and sit for a moment and see if you can continue to feel the impact of this one raisin, this one grape among millions touched by the wind and the sun and the rain and the intention of many people and many hands to bring it to you, to provide you with that moment of sweet, sweetness. See if you can feel the connectivity between your own body and the sun and the rain and the wind and all the people that brought you this one raisin. Imagine if that was the last raisin you would ever eat in your life. How have you allowed yourself to savor it, to appreciate it? to allow it to connect you to this great Mother Earth. And as you are ready, if you'd like, go ahead and open your eyes slowly. The wisdom of the great Chief Seattle reminds us, all things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls the children of earth. All things share the same breath. The beast, the tree, the man. The air shares its spirit with all the life it supports. We did not weave the web of a life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. This we know. Well, it was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. after the last tree has been cut down, only after the last river has been poisoned, only after the last fish has been caught, only then will we find money cannot be eaten.
wonderful to have you back. Thank you. It was beautiful. All things are connected. So how was your experience with the raisin meditation? How many people just one chop and swallowed it and had to get out a second raisin while we weren't looking? It's okay. <laughs> Did anyone discover anything about the raisin that you didn't know before? Yeah? So often our experience with food is kind of like speed dating, right? Or one of those dating apps. We have this like quick encounter, have an opinion, and then swipe left, swipe right, and like on to the next thing, right? So it's good to take time to get to know our food. Well, I spent the majority of my adult life getting to know food by cooking. Food was my primary vocation for over 30 years. I started my first cafe when I was 21. I went on to cook at the ashram. Then I had a catering business. And then I started and ran a restaurant, an organic restaurant. And then I became the executive chef and food service director of a large retreat center, serving almost a half a million meals a day. We would cut about 60 gallons of kale each and every day. And then I ended my career as a consultant to other retreat centers. But through it all, I would always cringe if someone called me a chef. Because I never quite viewed myself as sharing the typical chef persona that I saw emulated, emulated in fancy restaurants or on reality cooking shows. I had not trained as a professional chef at all, and I had no interest in trying to push the boundaries of food with things like sous vide meats or smoked egg under glass or artistically crafted salmon plated to look like an ice cream cone, and yes, I actually saw that once. But instead, my journey to the kitchen began not from a desire to see what we could do to food, but more discovering about what food could do to us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of my personal story. During my senior year at high school and for the year that followed, I was in what had become a physically abusive relationship. It was a relationship that caused me to drop out of college after only several weeks on campus as I was too far away from this person who had a strong psychological force on me. It was a codependent, harmful, destructive relationship. And it was a relationship that I tried to leave many, many times, only to find myself pulled back into it. But then one day, something changed. And I'd been floating from job to job, and I got this inspiration to apply for a position at a health club, you know, back when Nautilus machines were new and aerobics was all the rage. Now, to my surprise, even though I had no experience, I was hired. And I was then taken under the wings of the club's two kind and very hippie-ish owners, Michael and Marianne Fitzgerald. Now, I just discovered right away that Michael and Mary Ann brought some very strange-looking food to work each day. It was a cuisine they referred to as macrobiotic. Does anybody ever hear of that, by the way? I'm just curious. A few. They told me macrobiotics was a lifestyle centered around eating pure, unadulterated, plant-based food that was in tune with nature. Macrobiotics, they said, considered two primary forces in the world, an expansive force, which they called yin, and a contractive force, a force that contracts, that they called yang. All life was seen as some combination of these two forces. And to be healthy humans, we needed to eat a balanced diet in tune with those forces and in tune with nature's natural rhythms with this yin and yang energy. Now, this made sense to me. And since they looked pretty happy and healthy, I decided to give this diet a try. Now, although its roots go back to the Greeks, the particular form of macrobiotic eating that they were promoting originated in the West in the 1920s by a man named George Osawa, who was from Japan. Um, another man named Michio Kushi actually brought it to America and became one of the preeminent teachers here. So because of that, 20th century American macrobiotics was very Japanese-inspired. On the menu was lots of brown rice, miso soup, seaweed, of course, pickled vegetables, beans, occasionally some fish, and very little meat, and definitely no sugar, no processed food, no french fries, no artificial anything. 
Basically, I knew how to cook nothing that was on the eat list, and everything I was currently eating seemed to be on the do not eat list. So since I was only 19 at the time with little experience in the kitchen, Michael and Mary Ann offered to cook for me. So each day I would work, I would come in and find a beautifully prepared macrobiotic meal waiting for me. So I committed myself 100% to this diet. Now here's where it gets interesting. Two weeks, only 14 days after this radical dietary changed, change, my boyfriend tried to physically harm me again. Only this time, I did not stay around to take it. I got up, and I walked out of his house, and I never went back. Now remember, this is something that I had tried unsuccessfully multiple times before. But on that day, something was different. It was like something inside me had shifted, and I just knew that I didn't deserve that treatment and would never go back, and I never did. After this experience, I sat back and I said, wow, what just happened? The only thing that had changed in those two weeks was my diet. Could that have had such a radical impact on my actions? I immediately became fascinated by the thought that changing what I ate could have changed me on deep and profound levels. And so I began my journey. I began studying food, not so much about the nutrients in food, but about this energy in food. I started to notice how both my physical and my emotional body felt after eating certain things. And of course, I needed to learn how to cook for myself. So enter a woman named Geraldine Walker. I'll never forget Geraldine, and she passed away just this last year, so I want to tell you about her. She was gorgeous. She was like this regal, six-foot-tall black woman who lived in the suburbs of Philadelphia. She had dedicated her life to teaching the art of macrobiotic cooking, but not just the technical aspects of how to make seaweed taste palatable, but how to cook with deep care, and purpose. She had no interest in trying to take dried rice and making it into something fancy. Instead, she looked at the rice, and it was as if she just, she just wanted that little piece of dried rice to be the most it could be. You know, as parents, we learn that we're not there to shape our children, right? We're not there to shape them into some piece of art, but to love them into discovering for themselves who they are. And watching Geraldine Walker cook was like watching a parent honor and love and mentor their children. Like, what does the rice want to be? Where has it come from? What is its purpose? I never knew you could or should ask these kinds of questions of a grain of rice, but there she was, this goddess woman was doing just that. And it was exhilarating to watch. But... The wonders of nurturing rice to its truest self aside, for those of us that dove deeply into this macrobiotic community, viewing life and everything in life through the lens of, through the lens of food really consumed us, maybe even a little too much. I playfully say that over time, I went from being macro-neurotic, I'm sorry, macrobiotic, <laughs> to macro-neurotic. <laughs> and eventually realized it was kind of unhealthy to have such an extreme focus on every single morsel of food I ate. But I never forgot the lessons of Geraldine and the other teachers I studied with, and as I continued on my own cooking journey, I always cooked towards this eye of looking for the impact of food and the impact that it made on the people who ate it. And so I cooked. I cooked and then I watched. I fed people, and I got really interested in what people chose to eat at different times. I noticed that some of the people who were super focused on only eating in-season, organic, natural food were not necessarily the most stable, balanced, happy people I knew. In fact, the more someone seemed to be food policing for themselves and others, the more they seemed to carry an inordinate amount of stress about food and that seemed to spiral them into more control and more stress. At the retreat center, we taught the yoga yamas and niyamas. These are the moral codes of yoga, one of which is ahimsa. Ahimsa is the tenet to do no harm or avoid doing violence. 
In our menu design, we had decided to expand from our purely vegetarian diet to offering fish and chicken because we felt that was the kindest thing to do for the population of people that were coming there for the programs. But I'll never forget this day this woman walked into my office and she very aggressively slammed her fist down on the desk and berated me for daring to put meat on the menu at a yoga center. Didn't I understand how it was not living with a himsa? And she became really virate and verbally violent toward me in her defense of the tenant of nonviolence. <laughs> I don't think she saw the irony in that. I also noticed that foods had been, that had been on Michael and Marianne's do not eat list actually seemed fine for some people at some times. After all, there were my mom's chocolate chip cookies. Now, for several years, I had avoided, avoided them because they contained the evil twins. Anybody know the evil twins? White flour and white sugar. And also, mom's cookies used Nestle's chocolate chips, which was a company that I'd also deemed was evil for its human rights violations. But then one day, I was visiting my parents, and I opted for a cookie. because I could taste the love of my mother baked right into that cookie. And truly, it felt like one of the most digestible things I had eaten in a very long time. So how do we square these experiences? On one hand, natural food seems to have saved my life. Organic foods are better for the environment and seem to support our physical health. Yet eating natural foods does not guarantee a healthy, peaceful, happy, centered person, physically or mentally. And then on the other hand, there's those cookies. I know we're all bombarded with conflicting messages about food. Eat more of this, eat less that, carbs are bad, carbs are good, fat is bad, fat is good, the list goes on. But what if, in all of those assessments about what is good or not good for food, we're actually looking at food all wrong, or at least partially wrong? What if the thing that food gives us most is not just about its ability to carry nutrients, fats, proteins, carbs, vitamins, fuel to the body? But what if food also carries non-physical nutrients in the form of emotions to messages to our emotions and our thoughts? What if food brings with it its story and somehow its story also impacts us? And maybe we, as cooks and servers and eaters of food, also have the ability to add to the food story and what it delivers us. Think for a moment about the difference between eating for celebration and eating when you're depressed, right? I know for a fact that a piece of, a piece of cake, or a glass of wine for that matter, eaten in celebration with friends feels wholly different than that same piece of cake or glass of wine does at the end of a stressful day while feeling down or frustrated, right? Two different things. It's like the same nutritional ingredients, but two really different effects on my body and my spirit. I also know that a fresh orange feels different than a pasteurized packaged glass of orange juice, although they may have similar nutrients, but a different story, right? And who hasn't had that experience of going to a beloved restaurant and noticing that the food just tasted different from one day to the next? I used to play a game with the chefs at the retreat center. If it was a morning where I was in meetings and I wasn't cooking, I would eat the food and try to guess who made a particular dish. And I was almost always correct, I'll say, but it had nothing to do with noticing the quality of the dish, but it really was the energy of the food. I felt like each of the chefs had their own energetic signature that they placed on the food, and I could taste it. Of course, food brings its own messages, too, like that raisin, right? That raisin had a story to tell you about the rain and the sun and the wind and the process it took to get to you. And I believe that everything we eat brings with it the energy it carries about its journey. I want to talk for a minute about misappropriation. We talk about that at times, cultural misappropriation. It's taking something from a culture without understanding or acknowledging the source and misusing it for one's own purposes. And I have to say, I think of misappropriation every time I go to the grocery store. 
and I see the mass of packaged, irradiated, chemicalized, adulterated foods that line the grocery store shelf, and I think, there it is, perhaps the greatest misappropriation of our time, and we don't even recognize it. I once read that about 80% of the food on the shelves of supermarkets today didn't even exist 100 years ago. And I don't know if that's true, but it sounds about right. And it's not because we discovered some new great foods. It's that we've crafted new ones from the same three ingredients. The energetic story of a bag of potato chips is infinitely different from the story of that fresh potato at the farmer's market, right? How very far away we are getting from the earth each time we eat. No wonder we think it's okay to throw plastic in landfills. We cannot hear the land anymore because we have become disconnected from it. It's like we have these corporations who have become the priests, right? Priests are those ones in some religious faith that stand between you and God, right? They're the messengers. Well, we've given that job to corporations with our food. We no longer pick it fresh ourselves or have that direct relationship with it. We allow these corporations to go and take it and package it and profitize from it. After over 30 years of cooking organic natural food and intently watching the results, I came to the conclusion that it was not some nutrient in the miso soup that emboldened me to leave that abusive relationship all those years ago. But embedded in that new food I ate for those two weeks and then beyond were some clear messages that my spirit was ready to embrace. Think about it. That food was so close to nature. In it, it still carried the story of the sun, a story of connectivity to the earth. The respect and love of the land by the farmers who grew those vegetables could be felt in them. The food had a story of connectivity, respect, love. And when Michael and Marianne added their message of kindness and care through their selfless offering to cook that food for me, it was like this double shot of espresso of positive energy. Right? It was just like, whew. And I think that every cell in my body was given that story of connectivity, respect, love, care, kindness, in such a large dose that my spirit was finally shown away out of that abusive relationship. The story in the food and in those that cooked it became a blueprint for my transformation. It's like they were saying, here, feel this, be this, and I did. Food provides nutrients to the physical body, but I think food also does so much more. Food connects us to the earth. The more direct that connection, the more clear we can hear the messages of our beloved Mother Earth and the more connected we feel to this very planet. We won't need to go to the moon if we care for the planet we're on. Food connects us to each other. The more we cook with love in our hearts, the greater the chance those that we cook for will feel that love. Sometimes I used to teach cooking classes and I remember this time a woman came to me and she was just like, oh, how do I get my husband to eat this natural food? She wanted to make him eat broccoli and brown rice and all those things. And I said, well, what is his favorite meal? And she's like, oh, steak and potatoes. So I said, okay. I said, here's what you do. You go out and you buy the best steak you can find and the most beautiful potatoes you can find and you go into your kitchen and you cook that steak and potatoes with all the love you can muster in your heart and then you serve it to him. And she just looked at me. And I said, do that again and again until you can serve that with him with so much love in your heart that that's what he eats. And I guarantee eventually he'll be a little bit open to adding some broccoli on the side too. We don't need to give each other our judgments when we feed them. Food connects us also to ourselves. Ultimately, before any morsel of food touches our mouths, we have the opportunity to add to its story. We can add shame, we can add guilt and judgment, or we can add gratitude and love and joy. The choice is always ours at that moment. Chief Seattle and the people who lived and continue to live with their lives intertwined with nature have always known what we do to our planet 
we do to ourselves. And by extension, what we do to our food, we do to ourselves. Margaret Mead once said, it's easier to change a man's religion than to change his diet. And yet, isn't food intricately intertwined with our religion? Not because you guys like to eat a lot. <laughs> if we truly are a faith that sees the interconnectedness of all creation, could we really walk through the store and not hear the voices of the factory workers who packaged that food? Not hear the voices of those in the processing plants or in the fields that were intricately involved in that food coming to you? Could we really pretend to not hear the messages from the animals we consume or the story embedded in the water that is integral to every single thing we eat? Thomas Berry, we are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and stars. We have broken the great conversation. By breaking that conversation, we have shattered the universe. I think to heal the earth, we must connect with it. And luckily, she gives us an amazing way to do it three, four, five, six, seven, eight times a day. If we can begin to hear the story of the rain and the wind and the sun carried to us through our food, I truly believe we will become the healers of this planet and maybe even the healers of each other as well. So may you forever know the power of the love that you can deliver in the food that you prepare for others. And may you forever feel the connectivity to this planet Earth and let it heal you with every bite you take. Blessed be, let's sing Blue Boat Home. What a beautiful way to end, shall we? Blue Boat Home is in the teal hymnal. It is 1064. <laughs>
I want to close with a quote from a good friend of mine, Mark David, who's also been uh, in this industry for a long time. He wrote a book called Nourishing Wisdom. And then he says, nourishment is not just nutrition. Nourishment is the nutrients in the food, the taste, the aroma, the ambiance of the room, the conversation at the table, the love and inspiration in the cooking, and the joy of the entire eating process. So may you be truly nourished by the next thing you eat. Blessed be. We hope you've been nourished in heart and mind by our worship today and probably a little hungry. <laughs> Please plan to join us next week as we explore our best intentions to live co-creatively by Reverend Deborah. As our child is extinguished this morning, please join me in the final words. We, they are posted in, your, in the chat and in the order of service. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the commitment, or the fire of commitment. These, These we, we carry, carry in our hearts, hearts and, and out into the world, the world until, until we, we are, are together, together again. again. Please join us for refreshments and fellowship in our fellowship room. I believe we're on the downstairs one uh, until we get more people and we need the upstairs. Uh, on the first floor, Nancy, yeah. Those who are online, please stay uh, tuned in and you will be moved to a virtual breakout rooms for fellowship time. At 11.15, our second hour activities for adults and children and youth will begin. Please see the listings and the orders before uh, of uh, the order of service. And before we close this morning, uh, we have an announcement of an activity on February the 3rd. Um, I'll have to read it somewhat. Uh, community education and advocacy event, uh, dismantling the school at, to prison pipeline in Cobb County. Um, additional ones like this can be found in the I believe it's going to be in Yeah, there's the some out right out there on the bulletin board for Stronger yeah. Together. There's some okay. of those flyers. Okay. Okay. And that is an online event, so please join us if you can. It is uh, sponsored by uh, Stronger Together and um, um, another organization that I just... The Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah, Thank you, Ann. Our service is not concluded, but our connection has only begun. Go in peace and take peace wherever you go. Go with raisins and take raisins wherever you go. Oh, that's what you say. Okay. <laughs> I'm just reading it along. <laughs> you owe me one.